Well, good morning again. It's good to see you. You know, um, maybe maybe you've heard of this, but distance runners will often talk about hitting the wall. Uh, what they're talking about is is when they get to that that point in the race, that point when they've been running so long and so hard that their body begins to send a very singular and unmistakable message to the brain. Stop. Stop. Uh, why are you doing this to me? The body begins to cry out. I, I can't go on like this. Don't you understand? And the runner's job at that point is to decide whether or not they are going to listen to what their body is crying out, or if they are going to choose to press through and to press on. And really, that's an experience that, that every competitive athlete has, isn't it? Every athlete, in, in no matter what field of play they are competing, they come to a point where they've, they've just got to make the choice whether or not they're going to push through and, and, and continue on. It's not just sports, is it? That's an experience we all have over and over again throughout life. <laughs> I mean, parents, come on. Uh, that, that, that is the experience of parenting, isn't it? And at some point when, when those kids, they're toddlers, and especially you moms, you have a morning that just doesn't end. And you just think, I can't go on. I can't, I can't do this anymore. And then you look at the clock and it's only 9 a.m. <laughs> and a wave of desperation washes over you. But then you dig down deep, right? And somehow you survive till they're teenagers. And you do it all again. <laughs> right? Really, that's an experience that, that all of us have who, who try to do anything that's of any real significance. You know, that's the experience that, that all of us have who choose to stay married, right? Oh, come, come on, you can be honest. There are days when my wife looks at me and she thinks, I don't know if I can do this anymore. <laughs> and I don't blame her. I mean, who would? But there are days that your spouse looks at you. And they just think, oh, I don't know. But those who continue on, those who make it to the end, they're the ones that somehow find that way to dig down deep. You know, any of us who choose to live our lives for things that will be significant in eternity, you know, for the stuff that will still matter years after we are gone, who want to leave our mark, not in this world and in this life, but who want to, to, to do something that will have mattered for all of eternity, we too find ourselves facing those moments when we feel like we can't go on, that we can't take it any further, that we can't get where we need to go. You know, quite often, just doing those basic things that the Lord calls us to do as believers, just, just being who it is that he calls us to be and engaging in the things that he calls us to do, there are times that we just feel like we're tapped out, that we don't have it in us, that, that, that we can't go on. But here's, here's the difference. When it comes to things like that, things of a spiritual nature, we can't just reach down deep inside and gut it out. It doesn't work like that. There isn't some hidden resource within us that allows us then to continue on and to push through uh, the wall, whatever it is. It's then that we have to, we have to look to Christ. 
where we should have been looking from the beginning, right? Oh, where we should have had our eyes from the very first moment. It's then that we have to ask Christ to intervene and to do through us that which we can't do on our own. Oh man, there is nothing that will burn you out faster than trying to live the Christian life in your own strength. There is nothing that will burn out the people around you faster than you trying to live out the Christian life in your own strength. We've got to learn to look to Jesus. And that, friends, is, is what our passage is about this morning. We find ourselves this morning in Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, and uh, last week we looked at the first nine verses. This week we're going to look at verses 10 through 17. So I encourage you, open your Bible, find Luke chapter 9. It's right after Luke chapter 8 for those of you who are having a hard time finding it. So I, I try to be helpful. Um, when you find Luke 9, will you do this? Will you stand? I'll read our passage for us, but I'd like you to follow along. As I read it, Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 10, here's what Luke writes. It says, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus all that they had done. He took them along and withdrew privately to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out, they followed him. He welcomed them, spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and healed those who needed healing. Late in the day, the twelve approached and said to him, send the crowd away so that they can go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find food and lodging because we are in a deserted place here. You give them something to eat, he told them. We have no more than five loaves and two fish, they said, unless we go and buy food for all these people, for about 5,000 men were there. Then he told his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. They did what he said and had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them. He kept giving them to the disciples to set before the crowd. Everyone ate and was filled. They picked up 12 baskets of leftover pieces. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we get to gather. And Lord, that this morning you promise that you will be our teacher, that you will take these things. And not only, Lord, help us to understand them, but to receive them and to be changed by them. And God, that is our desire. God, not just that we would learn more this morning, but that we would be changed by what we learn. Work by the power of your Holy Spirit within us, Lord. We invite you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. If you remember last week, the disciples had made that transition from merely being spectators watching Jesus do ministry to becoming actual participants with Jesus in doing ministry. They will, they, they, if you will, they came off the bench. If we can think of it that way, they went into the game. Jesus sent them out into the, the villages of Galilee and he sent them with his power and with his message and they, they healed the sick, and they even delivered those who found themselves oppressed by evil. And where we pick up this morning, the disciples have just come back from what well, was probably several weeks of independent ministry, several weeks of, of traveling, of preaching, of ministering to people in Jesus' name. And so we read there in verse 10 that when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus all that they had done. And he took them along and withdrew privately to a town called Bethsaida. So the disciples returned victorious, but exhausted. So much so 
uh, that Jesus immediately invites them to, to get away with him, to take a step back, to, to get away from the ever-present crowds and the never-ending needs so that they can simply rest. In one of the parallel passages in Mark chapter 6, it describes the same event. It tells us that Jesus says to his disciples, quite bluntly, come away by yourselves to a desolate place. We're going to go somewhere where there isn't anyone, Jesus says, and rest a while, just to rest. For many were coming and going, and they, they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Let me state the obvious because that's really what I'm best at. Rest is necessary. Rest is a good thing. Assuming, of course, that we've done something to rest from, right? Assuming that, that we've actually given ourselves to the task. And assuming, of course, that we understand what rest is supposed to be, what it's about and, and what it's for. You see, Jesus and his disciples, they weren't just looking to kill some time. They weren't looking to entertain themselves for a while. Rather, what they were looking for is a dynamic that, that Peter talks about in Acts chapter 3, there, as Peter is preaching, he, he uses this phrase that I think is so enlightening. He, he, he talks about seasons of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. Did you catch that? What Peter says is that where we get refreshing, where we get refreshed, it isn't from extra sleep. It, it isn't from being entertained. It's from being in the presence of the Lord. You see, it is God's presence that refreshes and revives us. And the reason for that is that that's what we were made for. That is what we were created for. God's presence is our native atmosphere. It is that climate, that, that circumstance, that condition where, where we were designed to thrive. Think about it. Hey, think about Adam and Eve there in the garden, walking in the cool of the day with God himself in his presence. Oh, think about what Revelation tells us about our future, that one day we will be with the Lord. We will be there in heaven, and what will make it heaven is the fact that we will be with him. We will be with him in such a, a, a way that is so real, that is so palpable, that scripture tells us there will be no need for a sun or moon because God himself will be so with us that he will be our light. How amazing is that? You see, it's being in God's presence that gives us everything that we need. And you know what? We don't have to just look back at Adam and Eve and wish they hadn't blown it. And we don't have to just look forward thinking that someday we will be able to experience the presence of God. No, no. God invites us today into his presence. He invites us to experience his presence and to experience that refreshing and reviving that can only come from his presence. In fact, in James 4, 8, we're told that if we will draw near to God, what will he do? He will draw near to us. Friends, think about that. Think about how amazing that is. If we will just draw near to God, he will reject us and push away? No. That's what we expect, isn't it? That's what we fear. And yet what scripture promises us, if, 
if we will just draw near to him, he will draw near to us. And so, friends, I invite you, I charge you, draw near to Christ. Seek to draw near to the one who invites you, who says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Draw near to the Lord and allow his refreshment and replenishment to wash over you. Well, for those who are detail-orientated, or, or maybe for those who have recently read uh, one of the accounts of this miracle in, in one of the other Gospels, by the way, this is the only one of the miracles other than the crucifixion resurrection that appears in all four of the Gospels. And so as each of the Gospel writers recorded this event, they each provided unique details in describing it. it and in particular, Luke tells us, as you've noted, that they went to this place called Bethsaida. They went to get away. They went to a desolate place, and it was near the, the village of Bethsaida. But here's a problem, because you see, Mark tells us that at the very end of the day, that when Jesus goes to, to send the disciples away from that place, there in Mark 6, 45, we read that he tells him to go to the other side of the lake to Bethsaida. Wait a minute, weren't they in Bethsaida? But now Jesus is telling them to go to Bethsaida. So which is it? Uh, were they there in Bethsaida when Jesus fed the crowd? Or did Jesus send his disciples off to some other place called Bethsaida? Well, obviously the answer is yes. Yes, to both. Yes, they were near Bethsaida. And yes, uh, when they left there, they went across the lake to a different Bethsaida. You know, maybe one thing that will help you understand this is that name, Bethsaida, it simply means fishing village. It means fishing village. And there were a lot of little places that could have been referred to as fishing village. And we know for a fact that there were at least two. There was Bethsaida Julia, which was the place near where the feeding of the 5,000 took place. But then there was also a Galilean village there on the, the side of the lake that was also called Bethsaida. Well, regardless, Jesus and his disciples, they're heading there to Bethsaida Julia to get away to get some time away. But the crowds, the crowds get wind of it and they follow them in hot pursuit. It says there in verse 11, when the crowds found out, they followed him. Now, this crowd was likely made up of travelers who were on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. Uh, John chapter six in, in recounting this miracle tells us that it took place at the time of the Passover, just before Passover. So as the people were, were traveling from their various villages in Galilee and making their way to Jerusalem, there would have been a lot of them on the roads. And so as they see Jesus, they turn aside from their journey they turn away from going to the Passover celebration where, by the way, think of this, they were going to be reminded of the fact that God had spared them, that he had had mercy on them. How? By receiving from them the sacrifice of a lamb in their place. And so the angel of death had passed over those houses that night in Egypt. And they turn away from going to that festival that reminds them of the mercy of God. And they turn to follow the one whom John the Baptist referred to as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so they go to follow Jesus. And Jesus welcomes them. Partway through verse 11, he welcomed them spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and healed those who needed healing. So Jesus sees the crowds, 
And when he sees the crowds, he feels compassion for them. His heart breaks for them. Matthew chapter 9, in talking about this, it says that when Jesus saw them, he saw them as being harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He saw them as if they were sheep who, who were vulnerable. They needed someone who would protect them, who would provide for them, who would give direction to them. Oh, what they needed was a shepherd. And Jesus... Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, Jesus says this. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus sees these people. He sees how lost and hopeless and helpless they are. He sees how much they need him. He would very soon lay down his life on their behalf. He would become their Passover lamb. He would quite literally become a sacrifice that would die in their place. And so is it any surprise that the one who would lay down his life for them would also minister to them even when it was inconvenient you know, Jesus welcomes them even though they were intruding uninvited. And he teaches them, even though he and the disciples had been teaching nonstop and they had, they had come away simply to get away for a moment. And he healed those who were sick, even though he and the disciples were themselves exhausted. Dear friends, this is the example that our Savior has set. This is the pattern that he has established. Selfless, unselfish, sacrificial caring for the needs of others. And, and this, is, this is what he taught his disciples that, that they were to do. And it was a lesson that they learned very well. And, and it was something that they passed on to us in their teaching. The Apostle John, the youngest of the disciples, he's there with them when Jesus does these things and says these things. And John passes them on to me. Eventually, he writes 1 John uh, there in chapter 3. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. I like that. He defines love by inference as being Jesus. This is how we came to know love. He, that is Jesus, laid down his life for us. But he doesn't leave it there. He doesn't leave it there. It isn't just enough for us to know the love of God for us. No, John takes it to the next thing. We are to take and receive that love of God and we are to reflect it out to others around us. Look at what he says. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. It isn't enough for us to tell people we love them. Hey, love you, bro. Oh, love you, man, love you. We've got to begin to lay down our lives. We've got to begin to put, put action with those words, to put into practice this, this thing that Jesus did for us and that he calls us to do for each other. And that is to begin to live sacrificially. We are to care for the uninvited. We are to love the inconvenient. We're to serve the undeserving. And we're to do it even when we're tired and even when we're tapped out. I don't know about you, but I'm lousy at that. I'm just outright lousy at it. Uh, when I'm tired, when I'm tapped out, 
I tend to be cranky and rather unpleasant. And my focus begins to, to converge upon what I want, not what on others need. And that, I'm convinced, is why the rest of the story is here. Don't you think it's curious that the one miracle that would be in all four of the Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000? I mean, do we really need to eat that much? I, I mean, is that what this is about? It's just about God affirming the fact that we need lunch, and it is 1206. So hurry up and get done with it so we can go eat like the Bible says. <laughs> or maybe, maybe there's another message here. And maybe there's, there's something else that is going on that is so vital, that is so important, that it's got to be in all four Gospels, because without this, we won't be able to do anything that Christ has called us to do. I think that's it. I think that what Jesus is doing here is he's showing us how to do what we can't do. Because let's be honest, what he calls us to do, you can't do. Not in your own strength. Well, let's take a look. Verse 12, late in the day, the 12 approached and said to him, send the crowd away so that they can go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find food and lodging because we are in a deserted place here. And I think the inference here is we are in a place that was deserted and is now overpopulated. Thank you very much. Now, let's not be too hard on the disciples, okay? Let's not be too hard for wanting... To, to send the crowd away. And let's be honest, you and I would not have waited until late in the day, right? I mean, I would have been hucking rocks at them by, by lunch. You know, get out of here. This is our time. Do you know why we didn't invite you? Do you know why we, we kind of snuck out of town? It's because we didn't want you here. You know, it wasn't even a, a bad thing that the disciples wanted to send the people away. I mean, after he feeds them, that's the next thing that Jesus does is he sends them away. Hey, they had to go sometime. They weren't going to live there. But Jesus wasn't ready to send them away. And I don't think it was just because it, Jesus wanted to feed them. He wanted to put them on the road with a full belly. I, I think that, that Jesus had something for the disciples to learn. I think that he wanted his disciples to see how it was that they were going to be able to do the thing that God was calling them to do when the thing that God was calling them to do was impossible, was beyond them. And so here are the disciples, exhausted after a couple weeks of ministry. And they're, they're now at the end of a long and unexpected day of ministering to uninvited crowds. And then Jesus turns to them and says, why don't you give them something to eat? Why don't you do it? Why don't you take care of them? In fact, that's, that's my idea. That's your job. I want you to provide a banquet for this crowd of people. Go for it. And the disciples, the disciples don't know what to, this is not what they expected. They respond to Jesus. They say, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Do you want us to go buy food for all these people? You do realize, don't you, Jesus, that there are 5,000 just men here. To the disciples, what Jesus said had to seem unreasonable. It was downright impossible. Not only did they not have that much food, there wasn't that much food available locally. The disciples are saying, no, 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 you don't get it, Jesus. 
In this whole region, there's no one place where you can get this much food. The, the people are going to have to spread out. They're going to have to spread out amongst the various villages in order to find food and lodging enough for them. The need was just too great. The task just wasn't possible. And yet Jesus said to his disciples, you give them something to eat. <laughs> they had five loaves. <laughs> they had two fish. Really, uh, quite honestly, they were more like five biscuits, okay? And you don't think loaf of bread. Think little, you know, dinner roll uh, made out of barley. And, and the two fish were probably more like a sardine. What they have here is a lunch they stole from a little boy. Now, that's what John admits to. He tells us the honest truth. Andrew took it from the kid. Andrew takes this little boy's lunch and he says, Jesus, this is what we've got. Jesus graciously does not ask too many questions about where the, the five loaves and two fish came from. The kid was probably still crying. You know, though, when the disciples tell Jesus, this is what we have, I even wonder why they even brought it up. I mean, we're, we're talking about a, a, a gigantic crowd here. And, and in the midst of talking about catering a mill for 15,000, Andrew pipes up and says, well, we do have five dinner rolls and two sardines. We got that going for us. <laughs> really? Re how is that even helpful? Fifteen thousand people. No real food to speak of. But you know, the math isn't the problem. The five thousand men plus the women plus the children, and even quite honestly, the food supply is not the problem. The problem here is where the disciples are putting their focus where they're giving their attention. You see, they're putting their focus on their lack, not on their main asset. And I'm not talking about the five loaves and the two sardines. I'm talking about Jesus. It's easy for us to see. We've read this story. We know how it ends. We know where this goes. But that's where they needed to look. That's where they needed to put their attention. What they needed to do was to turn to Jesus and to ask him because he was ready to feed that massive crowd through them. Isn't that interesting? Even when Jesus says, you know what, guys? This one's yours. Go for it. Even when Jesus tells them, I want you to feed this crowd, his plan all along is to feed the crowd himself through them, through them. Jesus has, he, he has no picture of the disciples running to, to Super One. You know, he, they're not going to McFish to, you know, to go grab whatever it is that they can get and, and, and get a carry out to feed 15,000. No, his plan all along is to feed them himself, but to do it through them. Here's a concept that you and I need to grab onto. And we need to make sure that we never let it go. When it comes to doing the things that God has given us to do, when it comes to doing the things that God has called us to, the only way that we can do it is if we let him do it through us. If we look to him to get it done. That's always his plan. That's the way that he works. And that's what he does here. Look partway through verse 14. He told his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did what he said and had them sit down. I, I like that they sat. This wasn't just a grab and go. This was a mill. It, it was a time for them to sit and to eat. 
And then he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them. And he kept giving them to the disciples to set before the crowd. I love what I see here. The disciples take what they have, insufficient as it was, and they give it to Jesus. They just give it to Jesus. It's in his hands. I, I know it's not enough, but it's yours, Jesus. Do with it as you desire. And Jesus thanks God for it. Okay, I, I don't know how good at math you are, but it conceptualize this. Um, Jesus is about to feed 15,000, and they hand him five dinner rolls and two sardines. And Jesus says, oh, thank you, Lord. Really? That is not my normal response in those kind of situations. I, I tend to complain. I tend to point out the lack. And yet Jesus thanks God for what is there. And then it says, he broke them, and he kept giving them. He kept giving them. I, I, I imagine that probably that description came out of how the disciples experienced this. You know, in movies, they always put Jesus behind a big rock when he does this. So you can't see where it's coming from, how this works. And yet here they, they give the, the, the little bit of bread and fish to Jesus and he just keeps giving them. And the disciples are like, what? But he just kept giving giving and kept giving and kept, and isn't that how the Lord works? He just keeps giving and keeps providing and keeps supplying. The disciples, really, they had nothing. They had no ability to get anything. They had no solution. But when they looked to Jesus, he enabled them to do the thing that he had called them to do. And dear friends, he will do the same for us. He will do the same for us. He will give us whatever we need in order to be able to do the things that he's called us to do, to be his ambassadors, to be disciples, and to make disciples disciples, to serve others sacrificially when we feel like we just don't have any more to give. And here's what's cool. He'll do it abundantly. He'll do it abundantly. Look at verse 17. Everyone, even the kid whose lunch had been stolen, ate and was filled and they picked up 12 baskets of leftover pieces. You know, that word fulfilled, it literally means fully satisfied. I couldn't eat another bite. And there were leftovers. There were leftovers. I, I think it's interesting that there were 12 basketfuls of leftovers. I can see the disciples each walking around thinking, well, there's not going to be anything here. And yet that their basket gets full. It's almost as if Jesus is like trying to make a point to these guys. He's like speaking to them even through cleanup duty. It's like, I got this. I can provide for you. I can provide more than you need. You know, I see really two main lessons here for us to grab onto. First is this. For any here this morning who have not put their trust in Jesus, who have not yet surrendered themselves to the shepherd who desires to care for them. He is the good shepherd. His heart for you is a heart of compassion. So often we imagine that God is angry, that, that God is, is just looking to squash us like a bug. His heart is for us. He sees us as lost and frustrated and needing him. And his desire is that we would come to him and surrender ourselves to him, that we would allow him to be our shepherd, that we would give ourselves fully into his care, put ourselves under his authority. If you don't belong to Jesus yet, 
He wants you to know that he is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd who will not only care for you today, but who has paid the price for the penalty for your sin so that you don't have to. So that if you will surrender yourself to him, you will be able to, as undeserving and uninvited as you are, to be with him forever in heaven, adopted into his family. For those of us who do know the Savior, we need to remember that the things that God calls us to do we can't do in our own strength. Man, there, there are so many things in life that God calls us to that we can't. And we will burn ourselves out and burn those around us out if we try to do it in our own strength. We have got to look to the Lord to do it through us. Instead of always having our eyes locked on the scarcity of our resources, we need to put our eyes on the abundance of our assets. And I don't mean the five loaves and the two fish. I mean Jesus. We have a God who specializes in getting things done with very limited resources. Little David, a shepherd boy, had a sling and a few stones. And he came out against Goliath, who had armor. He even had an armor bearer. He had so much junk, he couldn't carry it all. He had a choice of weapons. And then there was Gideon. Gideon didn't have bravery. He, he didn't have military know-how. And he only had 300 men who weren't smart enough to go home. And he had to face 135,000 Midianite soldiers. Did I mention they both had God as well? Because, you know, that makes the difference, doesn't it? That makes the difference. David had a sling and some stones. Oh, and he was doing the thing God told him to do and that God was empowering him to do. Oh, Gideon. Gideon had 300 knuckleheads, but he also had God because he was doing the thing that God had told him to do and that God was empowering him to do. I'll tell you this. Anything plus Jesus is enough. Any number plus Jesus is a majority. Any situation, no matter how bad it is, how hopeless, how done it is, with Jesus in the middle of it, it is a situation that has a living hope. We've got to put our eyes on Jesus. We've got to put our eyes on Jesus and allow him to do through us those impossible things that he has called us to do. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the Savior, the shepherd of our souls, the one who cares for us, who gave himself in our place, a willing sacrifice. The one who desires to lead, to guide, to equip, to provide for us. Oh, God, help us learn. Help us learn to day by day put our eyes on the Savior. Moment by moment, seek that refreshing, that renewing that will only come in your presence. to walk through this life having that perspective that we can only gain by putting our eyes on you. Being able to see the enormity of our God. 
and realize how minuscule our problems are. God, I pray for those who today are overwhelmed, who see barriers and issues and catastrophes that are far greater than they are. Help them to settle their eyes on Jesus. To look to him. And to be equipped by him. To walk through the storm. Thank you for your grace, Lord. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.